I'm so excited that you took the time to join us on the next episode of Beyond the Culture. This is the show where we embrace change and challenge cultural norms and ideals. I'm your host, Dr. David M. Walker. Hey, welcome everybody to another episode of Beyond the Culture. And I'm super excited that you're here with us today and we're gonna have a great show. But before we get into the conversation, as you know, every week we remind you to hit the subscribe button. Subscribe to the show. That way each week when we come on, you'll be notified that we're on. You can either hear us on Apple Podcasts or you can watch us on our YouTube channel. But hit that subscribe button and that way every week you'll know when Beyond the Culture is live and ready for you to watch an episode. And of course, the other thing I always ask is that you share the show. Share it with your friends, share it with your family. Let someone else know that you watch Beyond the Culture and I want you to share it with them so that they can watch it too and enjoy the show. Now, let's get ready to get into the conversation. Today, I have a great friend that's joining us on the show. And if there was anyone who has gone beyond the culture, it's my friend, JJ Burden. Let me tell you about JJ. JJ is a former NFL player he was selected by the Cleveland Browns in the eighth round of the 1988 NFL Draft. He played nine seasons with the Kansas City Chiefs and the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, Burden played at the University of Oregon. Burden was also inducted into Oregon's Athletic Hall of Fame as a track and field athlete. JJ travels extensively as a motivational and opportunity speaker and trainer for companies large and small team building seminars, as well as youth group life skill development meetings. JJ is the best-selling author of Eight Surefire Ways to Take Advantage. JJ is married and he is the father of eight. That's three biological children and five adopted children. And I am super excited to have on the show today, my friend, JJ Burden. JJ, welcome to the show. Hey, Dr. Walker, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a privilege to be on the show and looking forward to sharing with your audience. Yeah, I'm glad to have you on the show and I'm looking for uh, an exciting, exciting time. And as I said, as you know, our show is called Beyond the Culture and we believe in going beyond barriers, overcoming obstacles and winning. No matter who you are, no matter where you come from, you can overcome it and you can win. And of course, when I had you to come on your on the show, you know, I was looking into your background and I was saying, if anyone is a giant slayer, it's JJ Burden. And your whole story is about overcoming and winning against the odds. And um, as I said, you were an NFL player, but I wanna read something here that I found about you. It's on your website, but it talked about how you were uh, the number one high school uh, why receive it in Oregon, but you never received a division one scholarship. Uh, it says JJ was fast. You were five, nine, but you were only 133 pounds. Uh, you, it says you were too small to play with the big boys. At least that's what they said, but you didn't accept that as your limitation and your barrier. And you overcame that. And of course you believe that, you know, you can set your mind to uh, achieve the impossible. So I want you to just to kind of go back to your background a little bit and just kind of just talk about being that little guy, good athlete, but people still kept saying you're too small. Yeah, that's kind of been a theme of my life. You know, always hearing that you're too small, you don't belong, you should do something else. And it, it started back in, you know, in grade school and junior high. And, and then when I got to high school, like you mentioned, um, I was a very well accomplished track and field athlete and football player. And my senior year being the number one wide receiver statistically by far, but when college coaches came around to do recruiting, they just totally ignored me. Just put me in this category, 5'9", 133 pounds, cannot play D1, cannot play division one. And I didn't have one division one football program even offer me. And, and it was like, even though they saw me as an underdog, I didn't see myself as an underdog. I knew in my heart I was a D1 athlete. And I recognized that I might have to go a, a, a different route to get there, but somehow I was going to get on a Division I football program at some point. And, 
And that's when Dr. Will, uh, Dr. Walker, Dr. Will, my buddy that we both <laughs> yeah, know. Yeah, sure, absolutely. But um, Dr. Walker, that's when I formed the plan. At that, that my senior year, I formed the plan that was going to get me on the field eventually. So, so you got to Oregon. I want to talk about that for a little, a little bit. But I don't. You didn't get there as a football player. I assume you got there as a track athlete. Is that right? Correct. Talk about Correct. that. Yeah, as a track athlete, and, and what's interesting is that going into my senior year and having that great football season and then dealing with all the re rejection, is, it just really increased my desire to, to prove everybody wrong and to work even harder. So I figured that if I put in the work early, starting in the winter and then going into the spring for track, that I could have that kind of year that I'd have Division One's programs wanting to bring me in as a track athlete. And that's exactly what happened i had like the number two long jump in the nation 24 9 and i was a high hurdler and i could pretty much pick my school uh track wise but every time a school reached out to me dr walker i would say what do you think about me trying football one year and all the division one schools are like nope you're a track guy except for oregon oregon was the only school that said hey if you come to oregon you run for the ducks and if you can convince the coach your second year to give you a shot, you have our blessing. And all I saw was opportunity. I just want to get that opportunity, get that chance. And that was one of the reasons why I went to Oregon, but which turned out to be a great decision because Oregon was a track powerhouse. That freshman year on Oregon's track team, we won the national championship. Wow. That's why I got inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame. So it ended up being a good decision track wise, too. You know, that, that, that's a great story. And something you said, I didn't read this earlier, and I love it because it says here that uh, at, for, for JJ says all he needed was an opportunity. And, and really, that's what life is all about. Just give me an opportunity. And then the last part says, no matter how small, uh, even if you have to make one. And sometimes in life, you have to make your own opportunity, right? Yeah, yeah that's a very important component. It's something I try to really teach in a lot of my keynotes because, like you said, all I need is an opportunity, but sometimes the opportunity doesn't present itself. So sometimes in life, you have to create opportunities where it appears it doesn't exist. And so when I got to Oregon that first year, I ran track the second or during the spring when I was we were working out at the gym. One week, I started sneaking off and watching the football practices because they were in spring ball. Okay. And I wanted to just measure up with these guys and say, okay, let's see if these guys are really that much bigger than me. And Dr. Walker, I watched two or three practices and I determined that, okay, these guys are no better than me. Now I got to somehow get noticed. So the very next day I go to spring ball practice and I'm standing on the field. I'm kind of by the goalposts and you're not supposed to be on the field, but I figured someone's going to tell me to leave, but I'm going to tell them why I'm there. And uh, sure enough, sat, stood there for about an hour and then the head football coach, Rich Brooks, mm. he catches sight of me. He walks all the way down the field and he's walking toward me. And I'm like, uh oh, this is this is really about to happen. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> Here it comes. And he's like, Burden, I know who you are. You're the track kid. I saw you in the stands. He goes, What are you doing out here? And I was like, Coach, I want to play. And he's like, Well, we kind of evaluated you and we felt you were too small. And I was like, Coach, I can do this. Just give me a shot. And we just kind of went back and forth and he says, okay, you come to my office tomorrow and let's talk about it. So the next day I go to head coach Rich Brooks office and we have a 30 minute conversation. And most of that conversation is just convincing him. I'm not too small. I can do it. And he finally said, okay, I tell you what, I'm going to let you walk on this fall. I'll let you walk on and we'll give you a shot. And if you make it, he says, we'll take your track scholarship and switch it over to football. And he said, if it doesn't work out, that's okay. And we'll just, you just go back to running track exclusively. But again, opportunity, my foot was about to get in the door. And that was really the whole goal. That's a great story of seeing what you want, being determined to get it and, you know, being persistent until you get the results you want. And I think that is, uh, that's phenomenal. Now, you did make it to the NFL, and obviously you, you played for one or two seasons um, on Oregon's football team, and it was good enough to make it to the NFL. 
And I do want to read this stat about the NFL because so many young kids dream about making it to the pros. I was even talking to uh, someone on the show recently and uh, Tawana Smith, and she was talking about how she helps athletes basically for after the game, right? Because they, they, they athletes put so much into either getting to the pros and some don't make it. And then of course, even if you do make it, the careers are, are not that long for, for, for many. And uh, there's a stat here that says less than 6% of high school seniors go on to play college football. And then of the 150,000 draft eligible college players, only less than 1% get selected into the NFL draft. And even if you make it to the NFL, the average NFL career is less than two years. And, uh, and most of them are at least six foot two, 245, which was way bigger than what you were <laughs> at the time. So, so the odds were just kind of completely against you. But I want to ask you this. What, what were you feeling when you made it to the NFL? Yeah, well, first, I have to be honest, because I really, I really didn't want to play in the NFL. It was never the goal. It was never the dream. I wasn't that kid who said, I want to be an NFL player. It was just a series of circumstances that led to me getting that shot. And it was really just people kept saying, you're too small. You don't belong. And I was like, I'll show you. And next thing you know, I'm in the NFL. And I recognize, I knew the stats and I knew the odds, but one thing I learned in life is that the odds don't matter unless you allow them to matter. Wow. You know, and I, and I recognize the opportunity I had. And as I got there, I realized that I was playing against some of the best athletes in the world, the best of the best. And one thing I quickly realized was that you have to learn to make those small incremental improvements every day in your game. You're constantly learning. You're constantly growing. You're constantly just evolving as a player. And once I figured that out and I could really use my skills and ability, then it was working every day to stay there because it's hard enough to make it to the league, but then even staying there is even more difficult. And so for me, when I made it, I felt it was an accomplishment. But then Dr. Walker, I just took it year by year. And okay. my goal initially was to play four years because you're a vested player when you're a four year player. And once I hit that mark, then it was like, let's see if we can play another year. Then it was like, let's see if we can play another year. But the whole time I was planning for life after the game. And I think I'm one of those rare players who, you know, who did not expect that they would play, but they got the opportunity but I was also going to make sure I was ready for the transition because that's what it was all about because you're an ex player a lot longer than you're an active player. That's for sure. <laughs> I love that. You are, you are an ex player a lot longer than you are an active player. Uh, for those of you who are just joining in, uh, you've tuned into beyond the culture. And my guest uh, today is former NFL player, JJ Burden. Uh, JJ, you you mentioned that you played against a lot of high profile athletes, and I'm going to mention too because I, I saw a video where you talked about your first year in the league. You played against uh, Hayford Dixon, and he taught you a few lessons. Uh, you talked about Junior Seau being on the other side, <laughs> but I'm looking right over your right shoulder, and I see someone that you played with, uh, which all you know all of us know about this legendary NFL player. Uh, Joe Montana, you played on the same team with Joe. Just talk about that experience and uh, uh, and how was that for you? Yeah, that was a pretty exciting experience. When I think about my career, I never made it to a Super Bowl, but there's some highlights throughout my career, and that was one of them. Getting to play two years with one of the best to ever play was certainly a privilege, but I'm always trying to learn. You know, I try to be a student of everything. And when Joe joined our team, I'm thinking, well, success leaves clues. What can I learn from Joe Montana? Because there's a reason why he had won four Super Bowls and Pro Bowls and all these other accolades. And the thing that impressed me the most about Joe was because when he signed with the Chiefs, he had already accomplished a lot. But Joe came in and he, he studied like a rookie. He prepared like a veteran and he led like a pro. He was a consummate professional at every level. And just being able to watch him and learn from him every single day really lifted up my performance and ultimately really lifted up the rest of the team too. So it's, um, 
it's a lesson or at least lessons I learn and I, and I apply them in a lot of my keynote presentations, especially when you talk about leaders, you know, cause leaders lead from the front, you know, mm-hmm. they set the pace, they set the example. That's what Joe Montana did. I was glad you, you said that because my next uh, question was going, was going to surround leadership and we're going to get into you as a motivational speaker. And, uh, but you, you really kind of said it that, you learn leadership, and I've and I've always felt that sports teaches leadership. You play f- base uh, football, I play baseball. Some people play another sport, but you learn leadership from athletics. And I just wanted to talk just a little bit more about that because that is so important to be an effective leader. Um, and then how you can learn it through sports that you can use later on in life. So talk about that a little bit for me. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of, there's definitely some correlation there. But Dr. Walker, I like to talk about leadership from two perspectives. One is individual leadership, your ability to lead yourself. And then obviously leadership when you're leading a group. And one of the things I emphasize when I'm speaking to companies is that, yeah, the saying there is no I in team is very true. When you're part of a team, you put the team goal ahead of your own. It's about team, team, team. That's true. But also, too, I think even before that, I like to flip and say there better be an I in team. Okay. Because if you can't effectively lead yourself, how can you lead someone else? Love if that. you're not setting the example, if you're not doing the do, if you're not doing the things you want everyone else to do, how can you effectively lead? And so a lot of times with individual leadership, I talk about yourself first, leading yourself, setting the example, setting the pace. And then obviously when you're leading and being part of a team, because I think there's a huge value when you've got a leader who is has that freeness of speech because they're doing exactly what you they're asking of you to do. And when you get that kind of leadership, you wanna follow them. You wanna be right there with them. Their leadership is contagious and it can lift up your performance. And so, um, um, so yeah, I think leadership is so important, whether it's in your family, whether it's in your business or whether it's in your in sports. Why, why were you motivated to become a motivational speaker? What, what was the motivation for that for you? Well, I think it was first, like a lot of athletes, um, I thought I would get into coaching. I love to coach. I did some coaching throughout my life, even during my career. Um, But I found some limitations in coaching. And the main thing I found was that when you're coaching, they only want you to coach this group. You know, (laughs) they don't want you sharing information with other athletes or other people. And I didn't like that. I felt like I had more to share on a broader spectrum. And I wanted to be able to reach a bigger audience, not just people in athletics, but there's everyday people, moms and dads and young ones and business people. And just, there's everyone that needs, you know, that inspiration, that motivation of those success tips. And so um, seven years ago here, I was in Arizona and I had a buddy who was bugging me about listening to this speaker trainer named Dr. Will Moreland. And I was like, oh, I don't have time to go see this guy. It was a Saturday. And my buddy Hassan was like, man, you got to check out this brother, man. He's, he's sharp and, and you might like what he's doing. So I go to this seminar on a Saturday and I'm sitting there listening to Dr. Will Moreland for three hours. And I was just like, there's my mentor. Mm. That's the one that's going to help me launch my speaking career. And once I partnered with Dr. Moreland and he really kind of helped me put my speaking platform together as well as writing a book. I knew that I finally found something that I could be really passionate about, but more importantly, that I could share my unique message because I don't know if you know this, in the last 32, 33 plus years, there has not been an NFL player who played longer than me that weighed under 160 pounds. Mm. You know, so I know what it's like to have your back against the wall. I know what it's like to deal with uncertainty, to deal with challenges, to, to be the underdog. And there's so many people out in the world that are dealing with that too. And if I can show them how I overcame it and give them action steps to apply, that's what makes me excited. That's what gets me excited about doing what I do every day. Can you give us a a, a specific scenario where you felt like, you know, you weren't going to succeed and then you, you overcame because so far it sounds like you, you, you've, you were convinced to win, but was there something that really 
was tough. It, it, you didn't think you would make it, but you found a way to overcome it. Yeah, there was there was a couple, I say, situations in my life, and I'm going to take you to the NFL. Being okay. the draft is coming up this week. Um, like I said, I wasn't really trying to play in the NFL. It was my senior year at Oregon track and field. I had qualified for the nationals. I qualified for the Olympic trials and the long jump. So that's where I was focusing. And then unexpectedly, I get drafted by the Cleveland Browns. And I thought, well, why don't I go to the, their rookie camp? They had a rookie camp the following week. And I thought I would go out of curiosity, kind of measure up, see what these athletes are like. But I also want to at least be able to say I gave it a shot. But Dr. Walker, I was focusing on track. So I go to the mini camp and the third practice out there, I tear up my ACL ligament. Okay. So imagine what I was feeling. Mm. An injury that's going to take you out for a year to two years. Track season is done. That dream is over. And I remember sitting in that treatment center and thinking like, man, you know, look at these guys. They're just so big. They're amazing. I mean, I already tore up my ACL ligament. What am I doing here? Well, the best thing that happened was that injury okay. because that injury allowed me to sit on injury reserve for a year and watch practice every day and watch and sit in the meetings every day and watch these players. And during that year, I went from, there's no way I can play in the NFL to, oh yeah, I can do this. My belief system went from here to there. And that's what I needed to first to believe I could do it and then back up with the work to do what it takes. But yeah, there was that moment in there. Where I was like, man, can I really play in the NFL? But one of the things I teach in my keynotes is about FASCO. FASCO moments, failures, adversities, setbacks, challenges, and obstacles. It's part of life. And that was definitely a FASCO moment for me. But one thing when you have a growth mindset, you take those moments and you say, why did it happen? What can I learn from it? And how can I turn this into an opportunity? And that was the approach I took after that ACL, which I went on to play nine years in the league. I mean, that was powerful, powerful. Um, and how you, you, again, how you persisted and you kept on going. Let me ask you this, JJ. Um, I always ask a question of my guests. It, I call it the challenge and change question. And because that's what our show is about. It's a show where we embrace change and we challenge cultural norms and ideals. Um, let me ask you, what would you say uh, a change that you have embraced and something that is like a traditional norm that you have challenged to make sure um, that a change happens? Is there anything you can think of? Right away, I probably would think from my childhood, you know, I was raised in Northeast Portland. I was raised in the hood, you know, okay. we, we, we struggled growing up, you know, we, it was tough, but um, early on, I just saw a lot of my family members and my friends making decisions that kind of kept them in that cycle. Okay. Like you're just supposed to stay there. That was kind of the norm. And I made an early decision that I wasn't going to be the victim. I was going to be the victor. I was going to go out there and create um, I was going to go out there and break the cycle. Let's put it that way, break the cycle. And, and I went on to do that. But what was really cool was my cousins, little cousins who were all growing up and coming behind me, I gave them kind of that belief that, hey, you don't have to stay here and struggle and continue to do the same thing. You can go see the world. You can go do something else. And I think it really kind of set a pattern. And I'm watching different ones of them in my family that are now breaking that cycle as well. So, and I, I was the first one to kind of just say, Hey guys, I love family and I'm always come back here, but I'm going to go create future opportunities for my wife and my children and do the things that I wasn't able to do as a young one. That's rich because, you know, so many of our family members, unfortunately continue negative traditions. They don't see that they can come above. And because we all remember, you said you're from the hood, I'm from the hood. We all remember those days, but we didn't allow that to limit us to understand that we could come above, be better and bring someone else with us. Yeah. And I think that that's the most important part of this, uh, of overcoming and embracing change. Um, now you've written a book where you are, it's a best-selling book. 
It's called Eight Sure Fire Ways to Take Advantage. Talk about your book and how is it helping people? Yeah, so it's actually called When Opportunity Knocks, Eight Sure Fire Ways to Take gotcha. Advantage. Gotcha, thank you, thank you. And um, yeah, I was really excited about writing that book and, and Dr. Will was such a great mentor because I didn't know how to start it, what to do, and he really coached me through it. Um, but it was a very, um, it was a, it was one of those goals I had in life to, I wanted to become an author and it was nice to be able to check that off, but it was quite a learning experience. You know, I went through several drafts and all that, but it was just very fulfilling because I was able to kind of put my thoughts and some of the experiences and the lessons I learned and put them on, on paper in a book. And it has been really rewarding because my, one of my number one keynotes is seizing your opportunities, okay. which is really kind of revolves around that book. And it's been received very, very well because the book is for everyone. I wrote it for everyone because we all have opportunities in life. We all have things we want to achieve. We have goals, we have dreams, we have visions. And, and maybe sometimes people don't know what route to take or they don't know what steps to take, but when they learn a little bit about my story and all the challenges I had to deal with, but the action steps I put in the play to be able to accomplish what I did, it's empowering them in a way that, hey, if this guy 5'10", 157 pounds can play in the NFL for nine years and I can do it, do my, achieve my goals too. So um, yeah, it's been a thrill. Who would you say um, has had the greatest impact on you. I know you spoke about Dr. Will earlier, and if he's the one, then he gets it. But who would you say through your life journey had the greatest impact on JJ? I probably would. Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, the first choice is going to be my mom. Um, mm-hmm. I was raised by a single parent mom. Um, you know, she dropped out of high school. She's a junior. But mom was the one who taught me the the concept of you do what it takes to take care of your family. And my mom was a welder. She was the only female welder at this company called FMC. She had the, the big gear and the big boots and she'd come <laughs> home and we ripped those boots off her. And, but you know, the impact she made was just what I said, you know, you do what you can to take care of your family, but I'm going to probably add my uncle, my mom's brother, Mr. Uncle Sonny, Willie Bell. Um, he was a huge um, force for me early on, because early on, Dr. Walker, I didn't really believe in myself okay. and my abilities. And I want to tell you a quick story. Uh, my junior year in high school, my uncle came to one of my games and I had like four touchdowns in the first half. And he's after the game's over, he goes, nephew, you're going to play in the NFL someday. And I go, we ain't playing no NFL. What are you talking about? He goes, no, you're going to play in the NFL someday. And I'm like, no, uncle. He goes, no. I believe in you so much that I want you to, meet, you to promise me your first NFL touchdown pass. I'm like, uncle, you're crazy. He said, just say it. Whatever, you can have my first NFL touchdown pass. <laughs> Fast forward to October 21st, 1990. I'm with the Kansas City Chiefs. We're playing in Seattle in the, in the kingdom and my family lives two hours away. So everybody's there. Right. I scored my first NFL touchdown. So when the game's over, I got the ball and I'm coming out of the locker room and I see my family up there and I see my uncle like this, arms crossed, chest all out. And I was like, okay, just, just give him his due. So I come up to him, I give him the ball and I, and I take a knee and I go like this. And then I go, uncle, how did you know? I was 16 years old and he said, nephew, I knew you had the ability. You just didn't believe in yourself. So I needed to pour belief into you until you got your belief where it needed to be to take yourself the rest of the way. And he was right. I did not believe it, but I borrowed that belief all the way through college until it clicked that day that I could do it. And so the impact he made on me was huge because it was that, it was that fire, that fuel that I needed at the time. Believe in someone else's belief in you until you can believe it for yourself. And that's what your uncle did for you. And obviously, um, it turned out just as he saw it. And that's the wonderful thing about life is that we have to have people who will believe in us until we can get the faith to believe in ourselves. JJ, it's been outstanding having you on the show today and just talking about your life and talking about your journey and how you have overcome and how you have uh, been a winner 
and you have been an example to us. And, you know, I thank you for being on the show. But before we go, just uh, share with us, how can this audience get in contact with you? Tell us how we can get your book and then how can we get in contact with you? Yes, absolutely. Well, first, I'm very active on social media. I'm on all the social media platforms under the name JJ Burden. Uh, if you go to my website, jjburden.com, that's the best place to buy that book because even though it's on the other sites, but that book comes, that purchase comes through me so I can sign them directly to whoever's purchased them. So I'd say go to jjburden.com and, and, uh, and, and connect with you on social media. I love to connect with uh, those out there in the social media world and uh, try to give them some value and help them achieve their goals every day. JJ, listen, I want to take the time to thank you uh, for coming on the show. This was an outstanding conversation and uh, I really appreciate it. And as I say to all of my guests, you have gone beyond the culture and I thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Dr. Walker. I appreciate it. It's an honor and um, keep up the good work. You're, spare, you're sharing some positive content. That's what a lot of us need today. Now, if you want to continue to hear inspiring interviews like the one you heard today, I want you to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite streaming platform. Also, rate the show and please leave a comment. I would also love it if you would share this podcast with your friends to let them know that we're on. Finally, you can email me at beyondtheculturepodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. This is your host, Dr. David M. Walker, and we'll talk again on Beyond the Culture. Take care.